Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Q&A about history of science and technology. Uh, presumably our last one for 2021. Uh, I'm happy to try and address questions about either history that I've personally been involved in or things that I might have studied. I see that we have a number of questions as always saved up from previous times. So let's see, we have one here from Floppy. Do I think that science and technology progresses the way that Thomas Kuhn suggested in the structure of scientific revolutions, i.e. things like paradigms to crisis to paradigm shifts and so on? You know, I have to say, first, first point is that I had a copy of Thomas Kuhn's book for forever and ever, probably 40 years or so, um, and I've looked at it, but I can't say that I've ever actually read it cover to cover. So whatever I say about... Uh, the structure of scientific revolutions can't be taken to be textually what Thomas Kuhn talked about, nor can I specifically comment on that. But I can comment on kind of the, the pop version of uh, a summary of what Thomas Kuhn had to say. But let, let me describe the way that I see sort of progression happening in, in science and technology and so on. The, the typical pattern is a field progresses, a, a field that there's a there's a moment at which there's typically a methodological advance. And it's, and that uh, basically launches a lot of possibilities in a field. Now, there's sort of a, a, a there's, there's a different kinds of methodological advances. There are ones that are essentially driven by, for example, technology, the invention of the telescope, the microscope, the, you know, gene sequencing, a bunch of different things like this. Those, lead to lots of new information, uh, computer experimentation and, and mathematics, Lot, lots of new information being generated uh, as a result of a methodological advance. And there's then a certain amount of kind of low hanging fruit to be picked from that methodological advance. And I think what I tend to see is that there are a sequence of these things that happen in different fields. Once one of these has happened, there's five to 10 to maybe a little bit longer years of kind of low hanging fruit to be picked. And after that low hanging fruit has been picked, there's then the kind of slow cruise phase where people are kind of using that methodology, gradually tweaking things, gradually expanding on it. And that can last 50 years, 100 years until there's another methodological advance and suddenly lots of things change in that field. I think that's in, in lots of fields I've seen, that's been a, a characteristic kind of pattern. Uh, you see that, I don't know, machine learning is a field that's that's recently had sort of a, well, 2011 had a, a sort of a big burst of methodological advance. Uh, the field had sort of existed in some form since the 1950s or so, but it had been slowly progressing and then suddenly it takes off. Um, I think that uh, uh, the, the thing that I, I'm thinking, you know, Thomas Kuhn was more talking about had to do with shifts of thinking shifts of the paradigm with which one thinks about things. Now, at some level, those are also, those also relate to methodology, but it's not kinds of technological methodology of doing a new kind of experiment or something like this. It tends to be a new way of thinking about things. And it tends to be something where there is in a sense technology, but it is abstract technology. It's things like mathematical technology or model making technology, these kinds of things. And again, that's something that one has seen happen a bunch of times. Um, one's seen it uh, uh, with, um, well, I, I've been involved in, in some of these. Um, I think that um, a, uh, uh, a typical example might be the, the moment in the 1600s when kind of the idea of apply mathematics to make fundamental models of the world came into existence first with Galileo, then more seriously with Newton, 1687 and so on. This idea that you could use mathematics not as just sort of an extrapolation of what was happening in the world and to calculate things that sort of you already thought were in the world, but as an abstract way to define new models of the world and to invent things about laws of gravitation where you could uh, sort of solve for motion and things using equations, those kinds of things. The, the write down equations and have them represent the world was kind of a, a shift in the paradigm of how to think about the world. It had been previously more, let's reason about the world and so on. I mean, I myself was deeply involved in another such shift uh, 
uh, starting in the 1980s, um, the idea of using programs as sort of the raw material for making models of things in the world. And I think that that, that idea has been a, uh, in some sense, it's, 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 I suppose it's a radical idea in some ways. To me, it's always seemed like rather an obvious idea, um, but that idea has sort of taken about 40 years to kind of work its way through to the point where sort of typical new models for things are now made in terms of programs rather than in terms of equations. Um, I would say that that particular paradigm shift has in some ways been a, a, a fairly quiet one in the sense that there's just been this sort of quiet change from equation-based uh, models to, to program-based models. Now, you know, I have my, my book, A New Kind of Science, that came out in 2002, was kind of a, a, a loud description of this kind of approach of using programs rather than equations as ways to make models of things. And I would say that it was kind of interesting for me to kind of live through the actual on the ground moment of impact paradigm shift type, type thing. Um, I think one of the features of paradigm shifts tends to be that the that two things change, the methods of description that are used for things and the things that one is trying to describe, the kinds of questions that one is asking. And I remember talking to an older mathematical physicist uh, when New Kind of Science first came out. And uh, he said, you know, I look at this book and I, 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 it, all it has in it is pictures and, and programs. And, you know, I just don't understand any of it. He'd spent his whole career basically studying the mathematical equations based approach to, to doing physics. And for him, the kind of, the, 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 the methodology and description of a new kind of science was utterly alien. It was something where it's like, that's a program. I don't know how to describe things in terms of programs. Now, it turns out that is the sort of a key paradigm of the 21st century is to use computation to describe things. But this person was firmly sort of educated and, and, uh, and situated in the 20th century. And I think that the, um, uh, that's, that, that's one thing is the kind of the question of what, uh, of how you describe things. What is the, uh, what, what are the kinds of raw material that you use to, to make descriptions? Is it an equation? Is it a, a program? Is it, do you talk about things in terms of, I don't know, uh, genetic sequences, or do you talk about them in terms of traits of this, that, and the other? What, what is the sort of raw material for describing things? Another issue is what kinds of questions are you trying to answer or ask? And that's something that when you sort of change the paradigm, you change the questions that, that get askable and, and that people get interested in asking. You know, a classic example has to do with uh, fluid flow. And it's, there was extensive study from the equations of fluid flow, the Navier-Stokes equations invented, I think, around the 1830s or so, that are differential equations that describe the flow of fluids. And people have been interested in all sorts of special cases of those equations, and when could you solve them, when could you not? But you know, when you actually look at fluids in the wild, one of the features that they have is the phenomenon of turbulence. A fluid flows rapidly, it kind of curls up in all these random patterns of flow. And you might have thought that if you were interested in fluid flow, that that was kind of a front and center issue, but it wasn't. There were people talked about it, people uh, made comments about it, they had models, a few models of it, but really turbulence was not a front and center story in fluid mechanics. What was the front and center story was the cases where you could solve the equations of fluid flow, where the methods that existed at the time could actually make progress. The questions you could ask mapped into the methods you could use and that provided kind of the, the, the study of fluid dynamics. Now, with different methods, ones, let's say, based on programs rather than equations, you do get to say things about fluid turbulence. There's a lot more that could be said, but it's at least something where it's sort of obvious that you can start talking about it. And there are things to ask about it, like where does the randomness in it come from? Which is not really a question that was askable in a very serious way with uh, the approach based on mathematical equations. People had some approaches to it based on sensory independence on initial conditions and, and chaos theory, but I think those rather missed the point in, these particular, in this particular issue. But so again, when you have this kind of new way of thinking about things, 
there are new kinds of questions that you can ask. And we've seen that in a, in a major way with the computational X fields as they start to come into existence, that the kinds of questions that get to be askable are just very different from the ones that, that were there before. So I think that these are, these are sort of the three things that, that I see as being kind of drivers of, of major changes in, in fields. Uh, one is the invention of new methodologies at the level of technology um, uh, or at the level of, of uh, um, me methods that can be used, more abstract methods can be used. Another is the kind of descriptions that you can make of, what's, uh, of, of what you talk about. And another is the things that you choose to talk about or consider interesting, so to speak. Now, clearly, these three, three, three things are connected. Um, there are clearly cases where uh, the, the method of description is critical to, um, uh, to understanding what you can now ask or to understanding what you should now bother to go and measure, those kinds of things. But I think those, are the, those tend to be the drivers. And the thing that you tend to see is once one of those things has, once those things exist, there is low hanging fruit to be picked. And that's a process that takes only a comparatively limited time. You know, in, in the bigger fields, I think in the whole computational X area, maybe it'll be a hundred years, that that's, that's the, uh, maybe 50 years, that's that sort of period of ramping. But in more specific fields, I would say it's, it's sort of five to 10 years is the typical time frame, And it's always a bit confusing because those fields can go from just not existing at all to being things that exist. They may not even have a name at the beginning. They may be, uh, and, and it may be, and they're certainly not institutionalized at the beginning. It's only after that kind of ramp, after all the people kind of get into the field, they say, there's all this low hanging fruit being picked. Let's get involved. There's all kinds of cool things to do. And you know, one of the things that can happen is that there are questions where people said, oh, that's just not a kind of question that one can ask. You might have thought that a field like physics would set its subject matter on the basis of, well, it's talking about the physical world. But that really isn't typically the case. Typically, fields set their subject matter on the basis of the methods that those fields have developed to be able to talk about things. And things that are outside that domain, like turbulence in the case of physics, for example, tend to be like, oh, well, that's not really a physics kind of question. Not because it doesn't come into the domain of sort of studying physical systems or something, but because it isn't, it isn't approachable by the methods that have been developed and have become traditional in that field. So interesting question. I, I think that um, uh, the, the thing, well, uh, you know, I, I've now lived through a few of these paradigm shifts. It's very interesting. Uh, it's very interesting to see kind of the response of people because they've typically been in, in, I mean, my favorite cases is when there isn't a field there at all. And when you're basically building something like my book, A New Kind of Science, its main thrust is to build something where there just wasn't anything there before the study of simple programs, the study of the computational universe, those kinds of things, the applications to different fields. Yes, those fields were there before. And that's a place where you kind of engage with people saying, oh my gosh, this is a new paradigm. It's terribly shocking. But the actual idea of a, a new kind of science and exploring into an area which just hasn't been explored before is something that, uh, uh, well, f for me is, is, is sort of my favorite case. But it's, um, it's something where, well, for example, right now, uh, I, we just sort of hit what I think is kind of the, the, the fourth major um, methodology paradigm for modeling things that has been something that's emerged from our physics project. And that's really pretty extremely exciting. And I think is gonna be incredibly fertile over the next few years. And it's gonna be interesting to see how that kind of paradigm uh, gets under steam, so to speak, gets, gets, uh, gets into motion. I mean, just to explain what that's about, I see there as being, having been about, this is sort of the fourth of the major modeling methods of modeling things in the world. I think the first kind of approach in antiquity, it's kind of the structural approach where you just sort of say, what are things made of? You know, is it, are things made of atoms? Are things made of epicycles and so on? The second major approach from the 1600s is, let's talk about equations for describing things. 
And one feature of these approaches is one can sort of characterize them by thinking about how they treat the, the sort of the progression of a system, the, 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 uh, the, the notion of time. In the structural approach, there isn't really much discussion of time. It's just what's there in the system. How is the system built? In the mathematical equations approach, time can be a variable. We just get to kind of pick its value however you want. The third major paradigm for modeling, as, as I see it, is the kind of computational paradigm, which I was involved in initiating in the, in the 1980s. Um, I mean, it had precursors as everything always does, but I think the, the, the sort of the, the big push really, really began in the 1980s. And um, the idea there is, instead of having a mathematical equation that describes a system, I mentioned you have a program to describe it. And there, the notion of time is a bit different because it's like you've got this program, you start it running, you go step by step by step, and that progression of the program is the progress of time, and you don't get to jump ahead. There's the, this phenomenon of computational irreducibility that basically says to know what the system is going to do sometime in the future, you pretty much have to follow each step and see what's going to happen. So the sort of fourth paradigm, which is a new thing that's, that's come out of our physics project, thinks about time not as this sort of single thread of activity, but as something which has many branches and merges and so on. It's something where you're dealing with systems, as we think the universe is, where there are many possible updates that can happen, for example, in different places in physical space, at, and they can be thought of as happening simultaneously. There's a, a sort of, a, it's, it's, a, it's a flexible definition of time, so to speak, something which relativity had started to bring in 100 years ago. But the notion is that instead of there being a single thread of time, there's this kind of, uh, there's this whole multi-way graph, this whole network of possible uh, histories for, for things. And then the issue is, well, as an observer of what's going on, it's like, how can you tell what actually happened? Well, you are often, for example, in the case of physics, an observer who's actually embedded within the system. And so when the system is branching and merging, so are you branching and merging. And it then becomes a, a whole issue of what kinds of things can an observer notice about a system that's doing all this branching and merging and so on, different histories and such like. And that sort of requires one to have a more realistic view of the observer, but it turns out that it has a very great uh, consequence, which is as soon as you have an observer who's sort of like us in certain ways, has certain kinds of bounded computational capabilities, has the belief that there's a single thread of time, even though in some sense from the outside, you can see there's all this branching and merging, but a, a, an observer like us has the belief, the assumption, they, they sort of think about the world in terms of there being a single thread of experience. As soon as you have that, and as soon as that's the characteristic of the observer, it forces certain features to be observed in that whole sort of multi-computational, as I call it, process of branching and merging and so on. And it turns out those features in the case of physics, correspond very directly to things that we see in detail about laws of physics, about general relativity and quantum mechanics and so on. And what's turning out to be the case is that there are just a whole bunch of other fields where this kind of multi-computational idea can be very directly applied. There are fields where to me, it feels like those fields have been stuck sometimes for 50 years, 150 years, different amounts of time. They've been stuck because there isn't a description, a framework for describing things in those fields, that's allowed one to really uh, make progress and so on. And so I think the exciting thing is that with this kind of multi-computational paradigm, we're seeing the possibility to actually make progress in a bunch of these fields, whether that's molecular biology, uh, ideas about chemistry, distributed computing, linguistics, economics, a um, whole bunch of different fields, uh, neuroscience, where, where I think that, that there are sort of fundamental questions, foundational questions that have, that have been usually ignored in those fields for years, because usually what happens in a field is, at, at, when the field is, is started, foundational questions are very much uh, front and center. But after the field develops particular methodology, particular institutional structure and so on, the foundational questions usually get long buried. And those foundational questions, people say, oh, that's just too hard or they say, oh, that must have been answered a long time ago, even though I don't really know what the answer is. Um, 
And so it's, it's uh, so, so sometimes those foundational questions get kind of hidden or the field just describes itself around, defines itself away from those foundational questions so that they never have to be addressed. And in any case, I think the sort of fourth paradigm for modeling has the very wonderful, exciting possibility that we'll actually be able to make progress on a bunch of these different uh, uh, air foundational questions in these different fields. And by the way, what's gonna happen if that happens is classic paradigm shift type behavior in these different fields. People will say, well, I've been doing this field for ages. We describe things using equations in this field. We describe things using various kinds of descriptive things that don't involve equations um, and so on. And then there's this new methodology. And the new methodology will be hard for people who have been in those fields for years to understand because it's built on a tower of kind of abstract ideas that came out of computation and physics and a little bit of mathematics and so on. And it's, it's pretty alien. Um, and I think that, but it, it's sort of interesting when that happens because what typically happens is that there's some small group of people that for whatever reason either are receptive to learning something new or they already knew some things that were relevant and they're interested in that field. And so they become this sort of, this, this sort of uh, a small force that kind of injects itself into an existing field. As I say, it's a little different when one's going out into sort of into the vacuum where one's, where one's building a field where there just wasn't anything there before, which is what's happening with kind of the ruleology field that we're, uh, that is kind of the thing that comes out of new kind of science, this field of just studying simple programs, systems based on rules and seeing what they do. That's something where there really wasn't much there before. I mean, in the last 40 years, people have developed things, particularly, I think, uh, uh, perhaps inspired by things that I was doing in the 1980s. And so there is a rather fragmented field of some interesting contributions, but it's still rather fragmented. Hopefully we're going to be able to define a little bit more uh, explicitly that field moving forward. But in any case, that's a case where it's sort of expanding into the vacuum. In these other cases where you're introducing a new methodology into an existing perhaps several hundred year old field, it's a, it's a different story. And then you end up with a situation where there's usually a small group of people that know that new methodology and are delivering. Sometimes they deliver magical results that uh, people who are in the field already say, oh my gosh, we've been wondering about that for ages. You just delivered a magical result. That's one case. The other case is the new methodology comes in and answers different questions from the questions people have been asking before. And people who are in the field now will say, well, that's nice, but it's not really part of our field. It's really something, a separate kind of thing. It's a different kind of thing. And, and sometimes that's a better thing because sometimes when it, it depends on the way in which the magic results are introduced into a field, whether people just say, oh, that's wonderful, that's great, or whether they say, we hate it. You know, you're, you're overturning our field. We've been happily working in this field for years and we don't, uh, uh, you know, we don't need all this new outside stuff. Um, you know, there must be something wrong with this magic because it's so alien. Um, and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in this kind of fourth paradigm approach to, to modeling and so on. I'll, I'll be interested to see that. I, I think one of the things that one has to be aware of if one's actually at the front lines of kind of the paradigm shifty business is things, things can get very weird. I mean, in, in um, uh, the, uh, the way that... Um, people who've been doing something for a long time, kind of the reaction is often quite, to me, quite unpredictable. I mean, I've seen cases where fields have been in rather poor shape. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in, in bringing kind of a, a new injection of life into the field. And the people in the field are like, hey, this is great. You know, we've, we're, this is bringing some new life to things that we care about and we're interested in and uh, giving the field sort of a good reputation, and that's all good. That's case one. Case two can be, oh my gosh, we don't want you. You're an outsider. This is alien. The methods you're bringing in, we don't understand. We hate it. Uh, you know, pitchforks come out, and it's like, let's try and run this person off the reservation, so to speak. Um, and let's try and hope that these ideas kind of don't emerge in the course of our careers, so to speak. And uh, that, um, 
you know, my own feeling in those cases is, well, let that field go on its way and try and break off another separate field. I mean, in a sense, this is what happened way back before my time in mathematics versus computer science. There was a time in the maybe 1940s, 1950s, where sort of computer science could have been part of mathematics, but people in mathematics didn't want it. I, mem I remember once when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study in the, uh, what was it, early 1980s, um, there were people who'd been working at the Institute with John von Neumann back in the 1950s, building the, uh, the computer that was built in the Institute. And some of those people had, had then sort of scattered to, to different parts of the world, but they'd come back to the Institute for some kind of event talking about uh, kind of the history of computers and so on. And it was interesting to see some of the mathematicians who were at the Institute then and had in fact been at the Institute in the 1950s, who had absolutely, I would say, uh, been, been horrified by this idea that at the Institute, where there was, you know, it was a, a place of pure thought and so on, there was this nasty kind of oily, I don't know if it really had oil, actually. I remember somebody saying the word oily about that computer, but I'm not sure it really had much oil in it. But anyway, nasty electro electrical device that filled a whole building and so on, that was uh, just a very alien kind of thing. And I think there had been an opportunity at that time for mathematics to sort of embrace this notion of computation and theory of computation and so on, but it didn't. It pretty much spat it out. And that's how we came to have the field of computer science, the theoretical computer science, at least. I've seen sort of the same thing happen with a still not really fully under, under steam kind of um, um, uh, field, which is experimental mathematics. You know, most of the methodology of mathematics is you, uh, as a pure mathematician, for example, you are sort of imagining things and you're trying to write down theorems and you're trying to uh, make proofs of those theorems. A tiny minority will use things like proof assistance to sort of do that in a more formal way. I'm not even sure that that's necessarily the right thing in terms of, you know, it's kind of like let the robot paint your painting kind of thing rather than paint your painting as an artist. Um, but be that as it may, the, um, the idea mathematics progresses by sort of imagining the next theorem and then sort of making a bridge to it and so on. That is the typical way that pure mathematics progresses. Now, there's a completely different thing you can do, which is you can just do computer experiments. You can try and discover things that you never thought were there, just like you do in natural science, for example. And you just sort of make prongs out into this sort of metamathematical universe of, of things which you can explore, but which you hadn't even thought of before. And I've done a whole bunch of this. And in fact, there are certainly examples going back in history, even hundreds of years, where people were doing this as ways to discover things. Gauss, Riemann, people like this all did various kinds of experimental mathematics. Uh, Ramanujan was a big one for this. The, the, the thing is that that allows you to kind of make these prongs out into discoveries that were not what you got to by kind of bridging from one theorem to the next. Now, there are a couple of things that can happen with that. One is those prongs that you, that you, that you build out, you may end up in a place in sort of metamathematical space that nobody cares about. It's like, well, this is a thing, but there isn't enough of a kind of cognitive bridge from what people have already studied in mathematics to get to that point, to the point where people say, oh yes, this is something uh, that, um, uh, that mathematics um, is, uh, you know, that, that, is, that is the right kind of subject matter for mathematics. Um, that's, that's one thing. Um, the, uh, the thing that um, uh, you can end up with, um, well, I, I would say that that's you, you kind of this, this prong that's not part of mathematics. Uh, you can also end up with a situation where, where you're, you're kind of, uh, I guess that, that's, the main, that's the main thing that ends up happening. Uh, you end up also with a situation where part of the story of explaining mathematics is describing the proofs of things and sort of having a, a certain richness to the kind of explanatory structure of a proof. But when my computer just found it, and yes, I can formally see the proof, or I can formally see how the computer got to that point, this is something very non-human. This is something, again, that is 
that doesn't feel like it's it's part of the corpus of ideas that um, uh, is encompassed in sort of the traditional mathematics. But there's a lot that can, I think, be discovered about the subject matter of mathematics. It's like the example of turbulence in physics. You can't get to it by the methods that had been traditional in physics, but it is still something which is should be, in a sense, part of the global subject matter of physics. And so it is with experimental mathematics. There are plenty of things you can get to with experimental mathematics, but where you can't really reach that with the traditional methodology. And so that, that's sort of a, an example of a kind of a paradigm shift case in, in mathematics, which has so far been rather incomplete. I mean, there are plenty of people, myself included, who have delivered some sort of uh, perhaps magic seeming results that can be thought of as mathematical ones that simply come from experimental mathematics. Uh, I think Ramanujan was particularly big on delivering sort of magic seeming results uh, that came from sort of doing experiments and having intuition about them. Well, let's see, that was a long explanation. Let me see, more questions here. Um, um, oh gosh, so many things here. Well, uh, All right, let's do one. No, okay, there's, there's another science question here. It's from IC. Is science always based on finding patterns in nature? You know, I think the story of science is a story of trying to get to the point where we humans can wrap our brains around what's going on somewhere. And what does that mean? In some sense, that means we have to find patterns because lots is going on but we want to find some sort of brain reachable narrative for what's going on. If we say, well, there's a trillion, trillion, trillion atoms bouncing around in this box and they're all doing complicated things. And let me tell you, and it's gonna take me, you know, a million years to describe what, how each atom behaves. That's not a, a human reachable narrative for what's going on. So in doing science, what we're interested in is what's the, human level narrative where we can just kind of say in a sort of a human level in, in human language or computational language or whatever, we can say, this is sort of what's going on in the system. So in a sense, it's, this, it's a sort of compression from what's actually going on out there in the system to the way that we explain what's going on. That seems to be the essence of what science is, is about. And so if you say, is it about sort of finding patterns in nature well, first point is it's about finding a narrative for what's going on in nature or, or what's going on. I wouldn't necessarily in nature, say in nature because there's plenty of things that are in a sense uh, potentially accessible with, with science-like methods. For example, in areas like mathematics and experimental mathematics and so on, areas like linguistics and so on, where it isn't really something that is so much about nature it is an abstract world out there. Uh, Ruleology is another good example. It's kind of an abstract world out there that we're exploring, but we're trying to explore it using the meta method of science, which is basically, can we turn all the things that are going on into something which is accessible as a kind of human level narrative? And I think that's, uh, that's kind of the notion. Now, uh, interesting question, whether whether there is science that isn't sort of human level narrative. I think machine learning is a place where that is uh, sort of part of the story. You know, you can say, well, I've got all these things and I can make this machine learning model of all these things. And I can pretty accurately predict what's gonna happen in different cases, but I can't really look inside the black box. I can't really get a human level narrative for what's happening in that machine learning system. So is that science the way we normally think about science? interesting question. Is it useful? For sure it can be useful. Absolutely. The technology that you can build around, oh, let's use machine learning to figure out what's the, uh, uh, you know, what's going to happen to this particular system in this particular case. And, you know, should we uh, change this, uh, you know, engineering thing based on that in this case, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all absolutely useful and fair game for the technological application of quote science, 
whether the thing underneath that's just a black box is something that we would consider to be science in the sense that we've meant science for the past couple of millennia um, is not clear. Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's sort of a case where, where it's not so much, uh, I mean, in a sense, the neural net works by quotes finding patterns, but it finds patterns which are not related to a kind of human narrative about these things. Let's see, there's a question from Aaron here. Why did networked computing grow relatively slowly between the 1960s ARPANET and the 1989s HTTP? Was it a lack of imagining the internet's potential or technical barriers like packet switching and, and so on? That's an interesting question. I mean, so I started using uh, the internet or the ARPANET in 1975 or 1976. And um, the, I think, and how did I use it? Well, I used it through kind of facilities at a university that were part of government grants. And it was, it was in a sense, a very government science kind of thing. And maybe part of the story was that in the 1960s, in particular, in a country like the US and, and probably other countries as well, government science was the big science. And you know, from the Apollo project to other kinds of things to to all the things that were done with particle physics and all these other places, kind of the government was the big place that sort of science advances happened. Still, still the case that lots of the funding for basic science, that's where most of it comes from. But, but I, I would say that my impression is that kind of the government loomed larger in the progress of science than perhaps than it does uh, perhaps today, but, but perhaps that, so, so, you know, you only had access to, uh, and these, these, things like the ARPANET and so on, they were created originally for very definitely government purposes, originally military purposes, um, and then to sort of uh, aid in research that was sort of a kind of orbiting around those kinds of military and other applica government applications. So I think part of the point was that the, the typical access that uh, people had to that came through sort of government-ish things. And so among scientists, for example, there was an increasing amount of access um, that um, uh, came through those channels. Now, I, I can say, you know, when I started using the ARPANET, there were, I think there were 512 nodes on the ARPANET. They all had numbers. My, my favorite was 236, which was a computer at MIT that I used to use from England through some uh, bizarre connection somewhere in, I think, Scandinavia that was some military satellite type connection um, that uh, had been plugged into the uh, sort of science research ARPANET type thing. And you, know, you could literally go down, you could type at O and then each number and, and you'd get all kinds of weird, you know, uh, I don't think you quite got a welcome to NORAD screen, but um, you, you would get, you know, you'd get see all of the different uh, computers that were connected to the ARPANET at that time. But that was definitely a, uh, an in crowd. Now the question is, what would you do with these computers? Okay, so let's say you reach one of these computers, what do you do with it? Well, you know, I used a bunch of uh, this computer at MIT that was the MIT um, Project Mac, the multiple access computer. It was intended as a time sharing computer that would run programs that different people could use. That was a rare case. I mean, uh, in those days, most computing that um, was, was done, uh, you know, batch jobs were, were very common where you would sort of submit your cards or by that time virtual cards sometimes to a computer and it would then run them and, uh, and give you the results back. Something which sort of disappeared a lot during the personal computer and workstation phase, although it's back now with with uh, various kinds of cloud computing and so on that you can again run batch jobs. I have a few big batch jobs running right now, actually looking at something um, where it feels just like when I used to submit card decks through a wooden pigeonhole, so to speak, to get them run on a mainframe computer. Um, but uh, I, think, I think what, um, uh, so the question was, what would you do with the computers that you accessed and how did you get access to them? Now, the things that started happening 
Um, there was BitNet, which was an IBM sponsored thing, as I recall, that was a network created for universities. I, I, uh, that was something I, I don't know, I, I don't think I ever directly made use of it. And then there started to be the idea of dial-up uh, services of things like CompuServe, these sort of dial-up systems where you could get access to certain information and so on. And um, you know that was probably limited by the fact that to connect your computer to the network, you would be you know dialing up on the phone. You would have an acoustic coupled modem usually, where you pick up your physical phone. You know, a phone with with a a a, 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 um, a you know a, a speaker and a and a microphone in that in that big you know piece of plastic and so on. That's an actual phone, not a not a modern cell phone smartphone type thing. And you would take that actual thing and stick it in this kind of rubber uh, container that would listen for the tones that were being produced there and allow you to communicate that way. And it was not something where people usually thought of it as being something that you continually did. Now, I have to say, from the time I first moved to the US in, in uh, 1978, um, I was sort of amazed at the idea that in the US, local phone calls were free. That wasn't true in, in England where I had grown up. Um, and so what I did was I got my computer, uh, my, my terminal for a computer at home, and I had a, a modem and I dialed up the phone and I just connected the acoustic coupler and I just left it connected because after all, local phone calls were free. And, um, the, uh, uh, and I will say that, that I was very impressed by the phone system because it would last for months. There wouldn't be a single glitch on the line. It would be a perfectly clear connection and my computer, my terminal was continually connected to, to, to the computer that I was dialed up to. I have to say, and somebody was asking questions about Dick Feynman here. Uh, Dick Feynman's longtime assistant, a woman named Helen Tuck, um, I, I knew her quite well and I once mentioned to her that I did this thing with my, with my computer at home or my terminal, computer terminal at home. And it turned out before she had worked for Dick Feynman and Murray Gell-Mann and the theoretical physics department at Caltech, she had worked for the phone company for many years. And she was telling me, you shouldn't do that. That's gonna send a trouble signal to the, you know, to the main office if you just leave a phone connected for months at a time. That's, you're being horrible to the phone network to do that. Anyway, just a, a small footnote to, to, to history there. But I think then another thing that happened was email. And email was originally, I think, the, the earliest, well, let's see, I first used email in 1976 um, as part of uh, this MIT MC computer. And I think also I used it on the Rutherford Labs computer system, although not as seriously. And um, it was something where on a particular computer, people could send you messages on that particular computer. Um, I was for many years, uh, traumatized by the fact that I had really wanted the um, the login SW on that computer that I was using back in 1976, but another person had SW, so I became SWOLF, and that was my login for many, many, many years. Um, but uh, in any case, the um, the thing that uh, that was that was emailed directly on that single computer system, not something where you were exchanging it with other computers. The thing that started happening was this thing called UUCP part of Unix, which was a, uh, I guess that stands for Unix to Unix copy. And the idea was that one computer would call up on the phone, another computer, remember that Unix had been developed at Bell Labs, which was the research operation of the phone company. And so the idea that, the, that Unix would start making phone calls was thought to be a good thing because it's like, let's use the phone system more and have people you know, pay more phone bills and things like this. But so UUCP was this kind of network where you would have an email address that would be one computer exclaim, another computer exclaim, another computer. It was a series of a sort of a routing for how to get from here to there, which would allow you to, to send mail to, to, to people through a sequence of computers, through phone calls and so on. And that became a thing. Well, let's see, that was a thing uh, in the 1980s, that was people used to have email addresses that were BitNet addresses and UUCP addresses and things like that. But most people didn't really use email at that time. Um, I would say that uh, 
that was something that sort of helped stimulate what when when um, modern SMTP email came into existence. When was that? Uh, well, let's see. I, I guess people started using email fairly routinely by, I would say, 86, 87, 88. That was times when, when it started to be the case that there were routinely, um, I'm trying to remember when people started having emails on their business cards. Um, that was probably not routinely the case until until 1990-ish time frame, and um, that uh, and there were these various services uh, where you could go pick up your email from this particular place, whether it was CompuServe or the Well or a bunch of other kinds of online services. And I, I think I mean I have to say I didn't use those really at all. I used those at most as sort of destinations for communicating with other people, um, but. Uh, 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 let's see, the question was why, um, um, yeah, why network computing grew slowly. You know, I think that the idea that you would go to a computer, remote computer, to get, for example, information was something that came fairly slowly. I mean, there were, there were precursors of it um, where, for example, I used to use in the 1970s a service called Dialog, which was a, um, uh, uh, a reference searching service that was an aggregation of um, a large number of databases that have been used by librarians. Um, and there were hundreds of these databases, things like, uh, but many of them, most of them probably still exist, things like the Science Citation Index and InSpec and so on. And dialogue was something you would dial up. You would uh, then, uh, you know, you go and you do a search and there was slightly obscure, you know, search syntax that you would use uh, very much like a, a, a search engine actually, except that it had much more explicit syntax. And you would say, you know, how many, how many items do you get? There's some number of abstracts for papers or whatever, you know, print this set of abstracts, show them in more detail, whatever else. The notion of things like hyperlinks wasn't there yet. Um, the, uh, but in any case, with, with dialog, that would be a thing where you would dial up to a specific place, specific number to get um, to connect to these databases and get the information one wanted. Um, and that's something. And then at the end, it would give you, that was a very common thing, at the end, it would give you, this is how many dollars you spent on this particular transaction. I would say that in terms of generally connecting to the, the internet, it was, um, or the ARPANET, uh, it was kind of, um, well, let's see. Yeah, there, there were a lot of it for individual users was acoustic couplers through the phone system. Through, for institutions, there were sort of uh, uh, direct networked kinds of ways to, to reach the, um, the ARPANET and so on. But, um, but again, the ARPANET was something that was really used by people in the kind of the orbit of, of government kinds of things, not the general public. Um, and I, I think, you know, I remember in, even in the, in the late 1980s, that there had been a variety of services that had come into existence for just sort of collecting data from remote computers. There was Gopher, there was Waste, and both of them were just not that exciting. They were text-based. They were um, uh, they were you know they were innovations, but they weren't things that were directly useful to to somebody like me. I mean, I I used email, but I didn't use things like Gopher and so on. And then the web came into existence, and I think one of the key innovations of the web was the fact that you could have GIF images and so on. GIFs have been developed by CompuServe. Um, as a way to allow people to exchange images um, on uh, uh, through uh, bulletin boards and things like that, um, but uh, that was um, uh, those were important innovations. The idea of hyperlinks was an important one that I don't think existed in, in Gopher and Waste and things like that. It was an idea that was an idea that had been much championed by Ted Nelson. Uh, who had this very ambitious Project Xanadu that he still talks about today, 
that was kind of a very much more kind of uh, the sort of the idea of this this big network and but I think more of an idea of of attribution of um, uh, of value rather than just oh you can follow that link uh, something that never developed on the web was the idea of sort of micro payments for oh follow that link and they'll get a bill at the end of of going and doing this web browsing the web ended up getting defined as something where that didn't happen um, which I think was sort of a, a in some ways a quirk of history and it was different from what was true on CompuServe or Dialog or any of these other kinds of systems that involved you dial up to some place to get access to online kinds of resources. Um, this is a this is a long rambling answer, and I'm 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 sort of trying to explain different aspects of this because I'm not sure I completely know, um, but it's certainly the case that things took off uh, dramatically uh, by the early '90s. I mean, I remember being at. Um, uh, was I was at the World Economic Forum event in probably 1993. And there were all kinds of people there with all kinds of policy people and so on. And I remember saying, the web is something you should take seriously. And people were like, oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Oh, okay. You know, write down this web thing. So that was something that wasn't, hadn't quite happened at that time, at least in the, in sort of the global policy world, although it was increasingly something that was known to kind of the techie world. I mean, I would say that the, the other thing that I really noticed uh, with great amusement actually was the time when HTTP colon slash slash whatever started getting painted on the side of trucks as kind of a, a this, is, this is where you go to get information about this service or whatever. And that was kind of a, it was kind of a, a, a remarkable thing when, when one started seeing that happening and when it became kind of the, the story of a of, uh, of, of forward looking company was one that had a website. Um, and uh, it was kind of like um, these different d places where different areas where people would get websites and, and it was like when people got cell phones, I think like academics were perhaps the last group that I noticed getting cell phones. Sort of everybody else, you know, the kids had gotten cell phones long before the, uh, the academics got cell phones and so on. But in any case, you know, that was a, a thing that I think that transition must have happened. I, I remember you know, when I first started seeing, you know, trucks that had HTTPs painted on them, it was kind of a, a notable thing. And I think it's sort of interesting that the, the very obscurity of HTTP colon slash slash www dot whatever, that very obscure, almost druidic incantation, I think was in some ways helpful in kind of making the point kind of this is a geeky, techy, leading edge thing. And that was sort of one might have thought at the, at the beginning, when I first saw that, I was like, that's an incredibly bad design. I mean, you don't want people to have to type that sequence of what is it, you know, uh, 11 letters or something at the beginning of everything they type. What a goofy idea. Why do we need this? You know, the default should be to not have to type that. And if you're trying to get to FTP or some other service, you can type that, but don't make the default be this, this long complicated thing. But perhaps I was wrong, and perhaps the very fact that there was that kind of druidic incantation that was needed was something that kind of helped the theming of kind of the web as the leading edge, the kind of the techie, geeky thing. And perhaps that same thing has to some extent been involved in cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain and so on, that there's a certain degree of kind of, uh, uh, kind of unavoidable kind of uh, geekiness to the whole thing that sort of helps brand and, and characterize what's going on there. Okay, Aaron is asking, when did I first get introduced to the internet? I think I was explaining the answer to that. Um, uh, the first place I was actually exposed to the internet, what was the first place? The first place was, I think 1976, when I worked for six months at the Rutherford lab, I was between kind of uh, leaving high school early and going to college. Um, I uh, worked at the Rutherford lab, which was a particle physics research uh, place in England, and it was connected to the ARPANET. Um, and I uh, used it there. I was then, um, I'm trying to remember, when I first saw a list of all of the ARPANET hosts, uh, 
Um, I do remember um, I was worked at Argonne National Lab in the US in the summer of 1977. And there I definitely saw lists of kind of the, the first sort of digest of what was out there on the on the ARPANET. What were what were those hosts and what could you do with them? Um, and some documentation for that. Then much later, uh, I well, let's see. I, I think um, um, so. I was, as I said, I I became. You know, I first had an email address in 1976. Um, I think that email address probably wasn't accessible except through the MIT computer system that I was using through the ARPANET. Um, I first will have had an email address that was, let me think. Um, did I have an email address when I was in Oxford? Um, not sure. By the time I was, um, let's see, I must have by, by 1980, I certainly had an, oh yes, I, I definitely had an email address by 1979 because when I started working on, um, uh, on SMP, uh, my sort of precursor of Mathematica and Wolfram Language in 1979, I remember hiring a bunch of undergraduates at Caltech to work on that. And I remember communicating with them through email. So definitely by 1979, there was email at least uh, locally within Caltech. Um, and then as far as the web is concerned, I have to say when the web first came into existence, um, I had you know seen gopher and waste and so on. I really didn't think the web was gonna be anything terribly special. And I, I guess I must have first become really uh, aware of it. I mean, I became a remote CEO in 1991, and I was using, well, obviously, tons and tons of email. I mean, I have an archive of my email going back to that time. Um, but uh, uh, the I started sometime, must have been 92 or something like that. I kind of thought I was getting behind when I realized, oh, the things are happening in the web, and I should start paying attention to the web. Um, I have to say that the I had known the folks who did the first web browsers at University of Illinois, um, that must have been in 1987 or so. I remember one of the people uh, who worked on one of the first web browsers interviewing for a job at our company. So that must have been 1988 or so. We didn't hire them as it turned out. Um, and uh, uh, whether a good or bad decision, who's to know? Um, but in any case, the uh, uh, yeah, so I think that's 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 roughly the the history. Um, that's there's a question from Ed here, also about history of technology. Why did it take so long for highly parallel graphics cards to be applied to scientific fields? Um, well, people tried for a long time, but parallel computing is hard to do, and it's what's happened now with GPUs and so on is that it's kind of at the low levels of the libraries that people support GPU computing and the application level programmer doesn't usually do much with the GPUs. It's all sort of things happening at the level of the linear algebra or the machine learning or whatever else. Those are being done with great effort. Somebody has programmed those for GPUs and the typical sort of application level programmer or user is just getting to take advantage of those things rather than having to sort of actually do the explicit programming. Now, there were, you know, the, the whole history of parallel computing goes back a long way. I mean, the people started talking about parallel computing, oh, by the 1950s and 1960s. My favorite cellular automata were being thought about in the 1950s and 1960s as kind of very uh, simple idealized models of parallel computing, the ILIAC computer at University of Illinois, that must have been built in the 70s. And that was a computer that had many separate parallel processing elements. It was kind of the idea like in a cellular automaton that you would have a bunch of identical processing elements and you would split a problem up into all these separate pieces and get the thing done in parallel. 
And there were some problems which were much easier to see how you would do that splitting up the, than others. Um, then what happened by the beginning of the 80s, much of that effort in parallel computing had kind of fallen upon hard times. I mean, there was things, well, that came out of the ILIAC. There was a thing called the MPP, the Massively Parallel Processor, that was a NASA project, as I recall. Um, then there were a number of other university projects um, uh, that were various kinds of models for how you would do parallel computation. There were ones that involved a large number of identical elements. There are ones that involved more like the multi-core uh, computers of today where there were processors that wouldn't necessarily be doing the same thing and would be, and the problem, it, it, they would just be running threads in parallel rather than sort of breaking the problem up into lots of identical pieces. Um, I got involved back in, oh gosh, 83 or so in uh, this company called Thinking Machines Corporation started by Danny Hillis. That was an effort to make a sort of serious, uh, very parallel sort of many identical components uh, kind of computer. Danny had originally sort of conceived of the idea of the so-called connection machine computer um, from sort of some theories of Marvin Minsky's about AI and kind of this notion that AI is all about making connections between things. That's what intelligence is about. So this concept was let's build that in hardware and make something which at the, at the underlying level, it was a hypercube of processors, like uh, two to the 16 different processors in a 16 dimensional Boolean hypercube. Um, that was sort of the raw architecture. But on top of that was kind of this layer where one was able to sort of think about the computer as allowing any processor to connect to any other processor. There were many technical problems with doing that, which didn't really get adequately solved um, and were, I think, in the end, interesting theoretical problems. But the kind of the notion was, ultimately, it's a massively parallel machine where problems will be broken up into lots of pieces. One of the things that happened there was it was hard to find good applications for that. There was some involving text searching um, that actually became, um, uh, that was some, uh, there were ones, well, that was one, there was some involving uh, pathfinding on graphs. Um, there was some involving, let's see, what else was there? Um, there could have been image processing, but there wasn't that I recall. Um, well, and then another big application, which was one that, that I kind of developed for that machine was using things like cellular automata to do fluid mechanics. That was a big potential application, although um, in the end, the for sort of more business management strategy reasons, that application was not as much pushed as it, as it could and should have been. Um, and it would have changed kind of the commercial course, I think, of what happened with that machine. But it was, it was tough to break problems up into, into parallel pieces and to, and to have things work well. And, and, and even worse, it was really hard to understand how to program a massively parallel machine because we humans are not well set up to think. We can think in terms of every element does the same thing, but it's much harder to think in terms of there are all these different things happening and they happen at different times and so on. I would say that just recently, and I've been thinking about this problem for like 40 years, just recently as a result of our physics project and this kind of whole multi-computation fourth paradigm kind of thing, I think I finally may have the, the sort of raw material necessary to actually finally, finally understand how to do the best we humans can do at, at programming a sort of distributed parallel kind of computer. But that's been a long time coming and it's not here yet. And some of the things that that involves are quite are things that are pretty uh, kind of sophisticated and abstract. And I don't know, it's gonna be quite challenging to bring those sort of down to earth to the point where we can all use them routinely. But so I think one big reason is it's pretty hard to, parallel, to program parallel kinds of things. There are lots of tricky issues to think about that it's something where we're not well set up to naturally think in those kinds of terms. Now, as a practical matter, after, kind of numerical linear algebra became big in the 1960s and 1970s. People started wanting to do those kinds of things in hardware. And that was what led to first generation of computer graphics processors and things like that. 
companies like SGI, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, I'm sure they rethemed themselves SGI at some point, was a company that very much had the idea of having graphics processing capabilities built into workstation computers so that you could have this desktop computer that could do all this fancy 3D rotation and 3D rendering and so on. That's where um, the, the GL, well now OpenGL graphics language came from. And that was, there were a number of competing companies at that time, but SGI was probably the one that, that uh, went the furthest. Um, but that was something again, where somebody programmed the low level kind of microcode level uh, kind of um, uh, handling of the whole graphics processor and so on. And at the application layer, it was just like, let's send it some geometry and then it will render it on the screen. The idea of actually programming directly with that stuff has been very difficult. It's still difficult. It's still something where mostly people are just dealing with layers on top of all of that kind of thing. And, and certainly what we've done in Wolfram Language, for example, in supporting things like neural nets and so on is, is we've, we've provided a bunch of convenient boxes where the actual details of how that really works at the GPU level is, is something you know, we've worked on or we use libraries that do it and so on. And it's not something that is exposed to the, the typical end user. So I think this is a thing where the end of that story is not told yet. I, I actually think that I have something to contribute to that um, in terms of this sort of new approach to thinking about distributed computing and programming in distributed systems. And that's uh, something to look forward to for 2022, I hope. Right, I shouldn't go on too much longer here, but um, uh, okay, there's a, a another um, it's a question from William. Uh, no, there's a question here. For, sorry, from Wolf, asking, um, uh, mentioning that I at one point mentioned that I knew Julia Robinson, and. Um, uh, for more comments about that. Okay, so a little bit of history. So the field of mathematical logic was something that really got serious in the late 1800s. Uh, Gottlob Frege was, a, was an early contributor. Um, then it, um, it really got a big boost around 19, well, 1900, David Hilbert was, was sort of talking about it a bunch and thinking about how one would sort of formulate mathematics in logical terms. And then it got a big boost 1910 with, with uh, Whitehead and Russell publishing their big three volume Principia Mathematica book, trying to kind of show how all of mathematics could be derived from logic. And they developed this kind of fairly rich and very technical and rather non-mathematical looking field of mathematical logic deeply steeped in formalism, but of a very different kind from traditional mathematics. Um, it got kind of a, a bit of a, a, a side swipe with Gödel's theorem in 1931 of some sort of early hopes of we'll just be able to make all of mathematics mechanical looking like that wasn't gonna happen, um, but still they developed this field of mathematical logic. And one of the things that came out of Gödel's theorem was the idea of undecidability, the idea that there are questions where there is no finite computation which can guarantee to answer the question. And from that came a number of different kinds of problems where people could say, well, in this thing that looks a little bit more like ordinary mathematics, is there something undecidable in that question? And so there are a number of problems about of, of undecidability that were being discovered in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and so on. Uh, one of those, uh, was worked on by a chap called Raphael Robinson, um, uh, who was a, a mathematician at Berkeley. Not quite sure what his early mathematical work was, but um, uh, he worked on uh, tilings and the question of if you're given a set of tiles, like a set of puzzle pieces, and you're asked, can you use an infinite number of copies of each of these uh, puzzle pieces to tile an infinite plane? Can you answer that question in general? Clearly, if you're given hexagons, you can tile regular hexagons, you can tile the plane. If you're given regular octagons, you can't tile the plane. But what if you're given a couple of weird shapes? Can you tile the plane with those or not? Well, Raphael Robinson came up with a set of shapes, I think, oh, I don't know, six or seven of them maybe, where which have all kinds of strange notches and so on, where they have the feature that the class of shapes of this type in general you can't answer that question of whether you can tile the plane or not 
you might be able to tile for a trillion sort of tiles, and then it might get stuck. You never can know in general, it's an undecidable problem. So that was a result due to Raphael Robinson. Uh, Julia Robinson uh, became, um, was, was Raphael Robinson's wife. And um, she was a very strong mathematician who um, uh, for reasons of the, um, uh, even though UC Berkeley, California might today seem like it's at the vanguard or might like to think of itself as the vanguard of kind of uh, equality of everything. Julia Robinson for a long time was unhirable by the University of California um, uh, because, because she was a woman and that was sort of a strange setup. But in any case, she, she, that eventually uh, uh, got resolved, but she was working on um, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of mathematics there was quite a strong group in mathematical logic at UC Berkeley. Julia Robinson worked on a specific problem. This is in the 1960s um, with on, um, uh, uh, to do with Hilbert's 10th problem. So Hilbert in 1900 had proposed these 23 mathematical problems. The 10th problem was if you are given a Diophantine equation, an, an equation involving variables that have to be integers, is it the case that you can determine from any, if you're given a Diophantine equation, can you tell by looking at the Diophantine equation in a sense, whether the, whether the equation has any solutions or not. And it turned out that it became increasingly suspected that that question was undecidable, that if you looked at a class of Diophantine equations, that there would be no upper bound on how long you might have to grind to compute to figure out whether, whether an equation had solutions or not. And uh, Julia Robinson actually proved that Hilbert's 10th problem was undecidable for a class of, of Diophantine equations that involved exponentials and so on. And that was a big uh, development. It was done with Martin Davis, um, who's still alive and actually was part of a uh, uh, big discussion that we did about, uh, uh, the, um, about post systems a number of months ago and about ML post. Um, but in any case, the... Um, Julia Robinson and, and Martin Davis um, were responsible for proving that this um, uh, that these exponential Diophantine equations uh, made Hilbert's tenth problem, the version of it for exponential equations, undecidable. Subsequently, I think it was 1968, a chap called Yuri Matyasevich, young Russian mathematician, who actually I noticed I just got email from yesterday about about Diophantine equations of all things, um, uh, that. Uh, um, uh, was it was a time when sort of that was at a time when when the Cold War was sort of going on and and sort of what was happening in the Soviet Union was very separate from what was happening in the U.S. and apparently it was before my time but but um, apparently it was sort of a big dramatic thing when it was announced that this young sort of Soviet mathematician had proved that you didn't need to have exponential Diophantine equations you could encode the exponentials in terms of ordinary polynomial Diophantine equations. And so the originally stated Hilbert's 10th problem was undecidable. That was a big dramatic thing. And Yuri Matisevich kind of put the, put, the, put the cherry on the top of that particular cake or something that had been uh, uh, worked on by, by Julia Robinson and, and Martin Davis. Well, I think I, I must have met Julia Robinson because when the MacArthur Foundation started giving out its, its uh, uh, fellowships back in 1981, um, they were kind enough to give me one of their, their first batch of those things. And probably the most interesting thing the MacArthur Foundation did was every 18 months or so, they would have a get together of all of the um, uh, uh, MacArthur fellows. They would invite all of them, only a subset would come. But that was a fascinating group of people. I mean, in those days, the idea of kind of a mixer conference that had uh, people from all sorts of different fields was something quite unknown. I mean, in, in today's world, you know, from, from TED onwards to, to endless other kinds of conferences, the idea of just sort of bringing together people who might find each other interesting from lots of different fields is quite a known thing. But in those days, it absolutely was not. And, and for me, it was uh, uh, very interesting. And, and I met many people who I'm still in touch with to this day um, from uh, those early, MacArthur get-togethers and Julia Robinson, together with Raphael Robinson, was one of the people who, who came to those. Um, I remember 
oh, lots of people. I remember Barbara McClintock, who was a, a big genetics person, I remember meeting her there and, and people who are still around like Cormac McCarthy, a, a, a um, novelist, or people like Howard Gardner, who's an education psychology type person. These are people who are still around and I'm still very much in touch with. Um, and, uh, and many other people who um, have long since passed away were, were uh, at those early conferences. But that was, um, um, I, I have to say, when I, uh, when I, I you know, meeting Julia and, and Raphael Robinson, the, um, uh, they were just very pleasant older people and um, very, uh, uh, I, you know, at the time I was sort of, uh, you know, I, I sort of divide history into before the web and after the web. And after the web, you know, if I had met Julie Robinson now, I would have immediately looked her up on the web and I would have found, oh, she worked on all this stuff about undecidability. I'm really interested in undecidability. This is what I should talk to her about. But before the web, I didn't know any of that stuff. And so I don't think I, I'm trying to remember if I ever talked to Raphael Robinson about tilings, because I've been pretty interested in tilings for a really long time. And I'm not sure that I ever did. And I'm not, I think I must have known, hmm, when did I know that, uh, yeah, I must have known about, I certainly knew of Robinson tilings by uh, the kind of time within a few years of when I must have been interacting with, with those, those two. Um, but I'm not even sure I made the connection that, you know, Robinson, Robinson, you know, I, uh, and this is, this is, you know, the world of, of doing these things before the web. So I, I don't think I have any particularly uh, insightful uh, stories to tell. Um, I'm trying to remember, gosh, I'm, um, um, I have a definite image of, of um, uh, at least one time when I ran into those two, um, but uh, I'm, I'm not recalling anything particularly uh, notable to report about that. Um, Let's see, maybe one more question and then I should uh, wrap up for today. Oh boy, people asking about things I don't know about. Um, it's a question from Dylan about Heidegger. Uh, ask me again in a month or two. I'm, I'm, I'm on a, a, a big effort to really understand more about the history of philosophy, um, but I don't think I can comment on that usefully now. Um, Let's see. Um, AT asks, how does self-organizing order emerge in physics and biology? Are they analogous? Can the universe be said to be in the business of self-organization? Well, Okay, this is a topic I got interested in the late 1970s and been interested in it for a long time. But at some level, the topic is kind of, there's a trivial version of the topic. And the trivial version is this. Sometimes things will start very random and then they'll be sort of attracted to some state that isn't so random. So for example, let's say you have a ball rolling around on some landscape and there's, it rolls around and it can go in all kinds of different places and all kinds of different paths. And there's a kind of a lowest point on the landscape and the ball just always eventually rolls down to that lowest point. That's kind of the attractor on the landscape. And so you might say, there's all this complicated stuff going on, the ball's going all these different places and it looks kind of random and, and so on. But in the end, it's going to organize itself into the ball is down at the lowest point on the landscape. And there are many analogous versions to that. There are many things where you can start with chemical processes and, and there'll, be, there'll be something where the thing looks very random and then it'll organize itself to just be in periodic waves or it'll organize itself to make sort of certain kinds of spiral patterns or whatever else. These are things which these kinds of attractors are happening just because there are many initial states that the system can be in, but only a much smaller number of final states, like the ball rolling around on the landscape. And that phenomenon of of evolution towards attractors is something 
that is quite generic. It's something whenever you have a system where, in a sense, information is lost, whenever there's sort of more possible initial conditions than there are final conditions, that will be what happens. So quite a lot of what people used to call self-organization in the 1970s and so on is really just that phenomenon. And that phenomenon is, in a sense, a straightforward formal and mathematical phenomenon. Um, it, can, it can show up in more and more elaborate ways. I was very excited when I first saw sort of a sophisticated version of that phenomenon in cellular automata, where the things that you are attracted to can themselves be very complicated. Now, the next question is, how can... When, when, thing, when complicated things come out, how do they get made? And that's the thing I've been very long interested in. It's kind of like you've got some procedure, some program for making something. Does it always make something simple or can it make something complicated? And the big discovery that sort of launched my whole new kind of science thing and so on was the discovery that you could have very simple rules that would produce very complicated behavior. Now, whether you call that behavior organized or self-organized or whatever, I'm not sure. But the main point is that even from a very simple rule, you can make very complicated behavior. And you can kind of combine these phenomena. You can say you start off from random stuff. It kind of gets attracted down to something. And then that thing itself can produce very complicated behavior. But that's a separate phenomenon. The phenomenon by which one can make very complicated behavior, even from very simple rules, is something different from the phenomenon of attracting from randomness down to a smaller number of states. That phenomenon of being able to go from simple rules to elaborate, complicated behavior, core phenomenon. The, you know, my favorite sort of discovery in the, in the particularly dramatic version of it is in my Rule 30 Cellular Automaton, but the phenomenon is one that now that one has that kind of paradigm, one can look back and see kind of earlier versions of it in things like, I don't know, the distribution of prime numbers, the digits of pi. These are all things described by fairly simple programs, yet once generated, they look complicated and random. Is that what the universe is doing? Absolutely, uh, at some level at least. The, you know, I'm, I'm really quite certain that the universe, as, as we see it, is a story of going from essentially what one might describe of as simple rules to sort of all the richness of what we actually see in the physical universe. And so in a sense, that's what the universe is doing. But self-organization, well, sometimes that means going from something random to something simpler. And I'm not sure that's, that's what the universe, well, there's some aspects of, of what the universe has done um, that might be a bit like that, but I tend to think that the much stronger phenomenon is this phenomenon that's all wrapped up with computational irreducibility of going from simple rules to complicated behavior. I think that um, uh, when we look at physics and at biology, uh, biology, I think, makes a lot of use of this simple rules, complicated behavior. Um, we see that at, at very uh, sort of straightforward levels in like pigmentation patterns, growth patterns in biology, but I'm sure that it's something that gets made use of at many layers in biology. I would say that one of the things that has been hard to understand in biology is biological evolution is a kind of a gradual change kind of thing. And this essentially computational phenomenon of making complicated stuff from very simple rules is something that doesn't particularly, we don't really know how to mesh that particularly well with the kind of the gradual change kind of approach that biological evolution seems to make. And so that, that remains sort of a core fundamental question of biological evolution, how to think about that, how to think about sort of the, the making of more and more complex species. Um, and uh, if indeed there are more and more complex, I mean, as, you know, as, as viruses start to take over the world, so to speak, they're not, that's not a complex organism relative to, to us humans and things like that. And it's not clear that the, the winner in the struggle for life, so to speak, is always the more complex organism. But sort of there's this whole question of, of what uh, what drives kind of all of the, what drives sort of any complexity in biology? I think one sort of point of view is that uh, there's always a better program, that it's a feature of sort of a computational process that if you have a particular, uh, that, that, that um, uh, you know, if, if you have a sufficiently general objective, there will always be a better program at achieving that objective. And that's similar to the, uh, it's, uh, it's related to the phenomenon of undecidability and the phenomenon of computational irreducibility. There'll always be, if, if you have programs competing with each other in some measure of competition, there'll always be a better program that can be made.
uh, you'll never sort of run out of that frontier. And perhaps that's part of what the story of biology is. I, I don't think that particular thing is so much the story of physics. And I think that the, um, the question of, of how the relationship between physics and biology, interesting one. I mean, I have to say, I have long been of the general belief that the phenomenon of life is at its core very much related to computational irreducibility, my principle of computational equivalence, things like this, that it's essentially just a phenomenon of the ability to do sophisticated computation. I've actually been wondering recently whether that's really all one can say. I mean, it's always a question when we discover that thing on, on you know, Europa or something, and um, we say, is this alive or is it not alive? It doesn't have RNA, it's not like life on Earth, but does it have characteristics that make us think we should tag this as being alive? What should we really be looking for? It's been tough to know. And I've thought that there really isn't probably a kind of bright line distinction between the merely computational and the alive, so to speak, other than things that are specific to life on earth, like having RNA and, and things like this. And so I, I think, I, I'm beginning to think that maybe there is something that one can identify that is more sort of specific about life than that. And I don't know what the, you know, people have said throughout history that, that things that were hard to make machines do or other kinds of um, apparently just purely physical systems do were what was important about life, like being able to move itself. That was a, in antiquity, that was a common definition. Um, then it was like being able to achieve certain chemical uh, changes or being able to achieve certain thermodynamic changes or being able to reproduce itself. These are all things which gradually over time, we found systems that very much don't have all of the machinery of life, but still are able to do those things. And so we kind of have to think differently about what is the essential phenomenon that we identify as life. And I, I have this sort of slight suspicion that there may be some something to do with kind of the identification of individuals and things like this and the, the sort of the fact that life involves sort of copying a lot of mechanism, but not completely and so on, that there may be something related to that, that one can identify as being uh, sort of the essential feature of what it means to be a living system rather than just a computational and complicated system. I mean, I, part of what's inspired this idea is that I had long sort of thought that consciousness was another one of these things that was best just sort of thought of as being lumped in with generic computation. But I realized from our physics project that there's actually more to consciousness in addition to being sort of a bounded computational, uh, uh, computational but bounded computation. Another important thing seems to be this notion of persistence, this notion that, that to be conscious is to experience things in a definite thread of experience. That's our definition of consciousness. I mean, perhaps to the aliens, they might use that word, so to speak, to describe their experience, which might not involve that at all. It might involve a multi-threaded, you know, multi-branched kind of experience of time. But for us, our experience of time is very much this experience of there is a single thread of experience that we have. And, and that's related and, and that we have some persistence that we, even though we might at different moments be made from different atoms of space, it's still the same us, at least as far as we're concerned and the same thread of experience that we go through. And, and we can therefore have belief in phenomena like causality because we have this idea that we are constant. And so we can look at the causes of other things that way. If we were saying, well, we are remade at every moment and we don't connect one moment with another no moment, then sort of the notion of causality is, is lost. And this is related, for example, for us, one of the other important features of us is the idea of pure motion. The idea that things, that you can have things that move around in space without changing, that you can take an object, and even though it's made of different atoms of space where you move it to a different place, it's still the same thing. And that's also important to us as consciousnesses that we, perceive ourselves to be sort of the same thing, even though we're kind of, even though we might move around in space and be made of different atoms of space. So this idea of sort of maintaining integrity through space and time is something that seems important to the idea of consciousness. And I rather suspect that there may be a definition of life that is a better and, and tighter definition 
than just the merely computational, and that somehow relates to some kind of identification of integrity of the thing uh, with respect to its kind of existence through a certain amount of time and so on. Now, I don't yet know how this works out. It's something that, that uh, I'd, I'd like to think about. All right, we should wrap up here uh, for now. And um, so uh, thanks for joining us and um, uh, happy new year and uh, see you another time.